Hello and welcome to Broke Speak. Please welcome Lisa to the show. Hi. Hi, Jim, and hi, everyone. And this is my first time doing a Google Hangout. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm actually doing great. I, I had, uh, it's, it's a really big day weekend for me because I have this, and then right from this, I'm going to my son's uh, um, high school gym to decorate it for his high school graduation, and there's a graduation to dance tonight, and then he's having all these friends sleep at my house for the whole weekend. So it's probably the most relaxed moment I'm going to have for the next 20 minutes until the end of the weekend. What do you enjoy doing? Oh, God. I, I really enjoy meeting people. I enjoy travel. Um, I enjoy dinner parties. I enjoy food. I enjoy discovering new food. I, I really love reading, although I don't really get that chance anymore like I used to. But I guess when I retire, I mean, not retire from acting, but when I, I'm working less, then I'll get to read more. But I, I sure miss that. Yeah. And I, and I miss... I miss my home back in Canada, which is like Michigan. Same same types of people, uh, same weather. Uh, what do I like to do? I, I I love hanging out with my family. I miss my family so much in Canada. I love hanging out with my son and my boyfriend. He's like my, my family, my mom. I'm, I'm so lucky that I still have my mom. She's 86. And I miss my brothers and cousins, and I really miss them. Oh, and I like, like watching movies, of course. <laughs> what movies have you acted in so far? Uh, I've been in about 15 movies. Um, I don't keep track anymore because uh, this wonderful thing came along called IMDb. And so I used to have, know all of my movies in order by heart because people would say, what movies have you been in? And I'd have to recite them. And now I just say, oh, why don't you go to IMDb? And then they know them. But uh, I've been about 15 movies. My first movie was uh, called uh, Blood Relatives, and I was discovered by Claude Chabrol. In French, is Claude Chabrol. And he was one of the, uh, he's like the Hitchcock of French cinema. He was one of the new wave directors, along with Truffaut and Godard. And uh, I got cast in that. It was his first English language film. And I started off as Donald Sutherland and David Hemmings. And then he cast me again in a French film opposite Isabelle Huppert, who's the, uh, Meryl Streep of France, and he uh, that went, was his official selection for France at Cannes, and I had no idea what Cannes was. And my whole career, except for probably now that I finally figured it out, um, every time I'd be on the brink of success, I'd run back to my hometown and go back to university. So I didn't go to Cannes, and I should have been there. And you know, it was I had really fallen into acting because I, I was going to become either an interpreter, a journalist, or a, uh, an attorney, and I needed my, a way to pay my way through university. And this dance teacher said to me, "You should do commercials." And I said, well, "How do you do that?" You know, I was from a small town in Canada. She said, "We get photographs taken, we take them to an agent." And I had, you know, college photographers, student photographers, asking me to take pictures of me, and I'd done it. And so I asked them, and they sent the pictures to an agency, and I met with this agency, and they were right out of a Woody Allen film. They were so not nice, and it was such a, a downtrodden type agency and they never sent me out for about six months and then I got a call from the characters talent agency in Canada and it was in this really the top agency there it was plush and the people were all so nice to me and I didn't feel badly about leaving the other people at all and I, I had this agent who really knew how to market me for who I was and he booked I booked like eight nationals in six months and then how my acting in film started was he decided to uh, put me up for a film with uh, Henry Fonda called Grand Con Frank, where I was supposed to play a 14 year old. And I, I've always looked young for my age. So I went in and they asked me to read, and I'd never been asked to read before. So I thought, hmm, I guess you just read this script like you read out loud for a child. So I did it. I got called back and called back and went down to the final reading with the producer. He said, You know, you were really great, but we, really, we want to go with a real 14 year old. <laughs> that had no didn't matter for me at all because I, it was all fun and I was doing this school at the university and blah, 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 blah. And then what changed my life was Claude Chabrol coming into town and um, my agent wanted me to read for that and the casting director wouldn't see me. And this is like a great agency story. She wanted to see one of his other clients for small part and he said, I'm not sending him in for that part. He's not big enough. He said, but I'll tell you what, I'll send him in if you agree to see Lisa Langlois. 
because she said, oh, you know, Lisa hasn't done any films. So I went in and I, I met with him and we talked for a while. And I told him I could speak French. And at the end of the interview, he turned to his uh, associate who was the producer of the film. He, and he said in French, I think this is the best girl we've seen yet. And I'm thinking, I just told him I spoke French. I can't believe he just said that. But he turned back to me and said the same thing. And he said, you know, you'll know tomorrow. Famous story. Didn't hear anything. So I went up to see my, my father in North Bay, which is like a 200 mile trip. Hung out with him for a while. Something told me I needed to get back. We didn't have answering machines in those days. So I said, Dad, I just got to get back. Something's telling me I get back. I'm getting out of shape. I, need, I really need to get back to dance class. I get back really early in the morning. I open the door. The phone's ringing. It's my agent. He'd been calling all night saying, where have you been? They're waiting for you in Montreal today. So he'd never told anything. I get flown to Montreal, I get put in wardrobe, I get put in three scenes before I even read the script. <laughs> um, and that was the beginning and everybody thought, well, beginner's luck, and then he hired me again because he I could speak French. And I got really spoiled because I started working with European actors and where it's really a craft. And uh, then I should have studied and I didn't know that because I work with very strong directors, so I, I kind of nosedived for several years of my career because I, I was then only, two things happened, I was only as strong as my director, and since I was very intuitive, at first that was fine, but then when I started getting all this press, all these people kept asking me what my technique was, and I thought, oh, I, I better get a technique. So I started reading all these books on acting. So I went from being intuitive, which is, what children are, I and mean, people, all great acting coaches say, you want to get to be childlike in your acting, to being completely in my head and directing myself. And it, it took me a long, many years to get out of that. I started directing myself in my head, and you know, if I didn't have a strong director. And uh, I finally went to somebody who, a uh, coach, Kate McGregor Stewart, who had me play a lot of children's games, and I hated it. But it taught me how to be childlike again and to get into my body and out of my head. And so now I have no fears. Uh, I took a big sabbatical off my career to uh, raise my son and also care for him because he was in a catastrophic accident. He was actually having his 19th uh, surgery on his foot on Tuesday. And I've uh, been very blessed to work with legendary directors like I work with John Houston. I work with uh, uh, and we all know his, his, you know, many, many legendary films. Uh, I worked with uh, Judy Thompson, who directed Cape Fear and The Guns of Navarone. You know, small pictures. Uh, Hal Ashby, um, you know, the last detail, Harold and Maude, uh, Coming Home. And uh, people ask me, they say, well, so what are these great directors, you know, to tell me about how, what it was like to work with Cloture Bowl? So for the longest time, I was kind of embarrassed. I just thought, Oh God, I should have something to say because they don't—they really don't say anything to you. And then it became clear that that's what they all had in common. And John Huston said it: "You want to make a good movie, get a great script, get great actors, and leave them alone. Let them do their crap." And that's what I started seeing with the great directors. They would not only with just great actors; they would sit up, the producer would, and the director would assemble a great crew, great. Uh, uh, wardrobe, art directors, and let them do their craft and their thing. And that's that was the big lesson for me. And not to tamper with any of these people, not to tamper with the actors' performances. Um, and But w what's been so liberating for me is I went from knowing I was falling on my face and then having to, to each time not rely on myself but look up to the director, to getting back to what Claude loved about me and discovered in me my freshness and my intuitiveness work. I don't have to look to anybody to know whether I did a good job. I felt it. So, yeah. What have been some of your favorite roles that you've had? I'm sorry? What have been some favorite roles that you've had? Oh, favorite roles? Uh, Definitely uh, Violet Nozier, which was my second one. Of course, it's my mother calling, right? <laughs> and um, because, you know, there it was culture role and in a period picture. I was in Paris. I had been from a small town. It was the first time I 
haven't been anywhere outside the country, so that was wonderful. I, I'm working with incredible actors. And then I, I also liked working on uh, It Rained All Night the Day I Left because that was my first experience working with international American stars. I worked with Tony Curtis, and, and, and I was in Israel, so amazing location, and, and learned so much from watching his, his timing and seeing actually what a, you know, that other generation of movie star and what their life is like. And I, I loved working on Happy Birthday to Me because the first time I'd always been like the, the ingenue, only you know, young person in the picture. But then I did this ensemble piece with Happy Birthday to Me. I loved working on The Slugger's Wife because we had Ray Star producer, legendary producer, Quincy Jones produced me in four songs. Um, I mean, how great, you know, get discovered by Cloture Roll, get discovered by Quincy Jones when I'm singing. Um, uh, Ann Roth was with the costume designer, who's like the Edith head of Hollywood. They, they had the best in every department. Um, I also liked working on um, just some small films that I, I, I've enjoyed working on too. Like I, I can say that um, they bring something to it, like working on Doing Life, which is this movie the week I did. And, and um, Bert Metcalf was the writer producer who was so in all the MASH projects. And, you know, they, they, they read you and they, they, they get that you're intuitive and, and they don't want actors on TV indicating and they, they talk to you about story. And there's also some things I really worked on that were, were great films, but the directors were great. Like I, I did this film called Transformations, which I think is coming out now, but I did like 15 years ago, no budget, it didn't get released, but it was in Italy, but the, the director was so passionate. He talked about story. And I also liked working on this Mini series I did that was based on a Canadian hit film called uh, Hank Williams uh, uh, First Nations with Aaron Sorensen because again he he wrote it and he directed it he's very passionate and he talks story and when it's when people are there because they love the medium and they're not doing it for the money it's a different feeling than when you're on something and everybody says oh this is really going to work because it's going to make people laugh or we're put, putting these people together because you know people will come in and it'll make a lot of money. It's, when, it, when it's down to, because this is the story, and I'm passionate about it, we all feel it. It's a feeling. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I love The Slugger's Wife, yeah, because I got to uh, sing and dance and act. And, you know, I got to work for Neil Simon. How, what, how many people in a lifetime get to do that? So. Are there I'm any? Enjoying, oh, yeah. I, there are some films I'm now enjoying that I didn't enjoy at the time that I buried in my resume, but I'm finding all my son's friends and I have all these fans now that are younger who have rediscovered them and they're becoming cult films. And one of them is Class of 1984, which, of course, I, I liked it because finally somebody had the courage to cast me a different way. I mean, they, they did offer me the part of the, the nice girl. And I said, please, please, can I, I don't have to open my mouth to do that kind of role, please. We just don't think you can play tough. And I said, let me come back to it. But believe me, I have older brothers and they have tough friends. I can do it. And when I came back, they looking like I did and doing it, they said that you're the one. And um, so that's become a big pulp film. And then the film that made me move to, to the United States because it was the only film in Canada at the time being shot was this film called Deadly Eyes. And it was about giant rats. And it was Dash House, fresh up in rat costume. So that got buried in my resume because I was, you know, I, I thought, you know, you always think it's going to be the birds. You think everybody's going to be, you know, Hitchcock. You think, and, you know, we have Scatman Brothers and Robert Krauss who, who directed Into the, the, the Dragon. So you, you have these things saying, okay, this, this could be the birds. Let's do it. And it ends up being a big laugh. But now I'm laughing with them. But before, I, I didn't have that sense of humor because I started out with these auteur directors. And then the other one... The other rodent film I did was uh, uh, oh, uh, The Nest, and this is about giant cockroaches. And again, you think it's going to be like the fly. Because <laughs> um, you, 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 you always hope and expect the best from people. So I'm, I'm a lot more cautious now because I've been burnt and I've been lied to, which I never thought people did. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lot more cautious. And I'm also... There's things I just don't want to do now because I have a son and uh, things get put all over the internet in a different context. 
and um, that, it's it's I, it's 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 about context. Is there any sort of role that you would like to play that you haven't been offered yet? I what I'd like to uh, play actually is and one of the reasons uh, I abandoned being the lawyer, journalist, interpreter. One was, oh, this is a lot of fun. I'm getting to travel and get paid a lot of money. But the other thing was, is that I wanted to be, you know, to lend my name to charities. But now I do it like on a one-on-one -on -one basis because I feel like I didn't have to wait for fame to do that. But I really wanted to be in films that had social and political impact. And, and so that's what I'd really like to do even if it were one scene. One scene in a good movie that has a message is worth more to me than any of my past work. It's worth more. It'll be the most enduring. It'll have the most impact. So rather than be the lead in these other films that could be like really commercial or just to be working again, I just want to tell everybody out there, get in contact at me because yeah, I, I want to help you young filmmakers out there and I want to get a message out there too, because um, I don't have an ego. I, I, I've, I've worked with all the big people, and I noticed that, man, these these beginners can have a lot in common with the big people I've worked with. It, I, I under I get it now, and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of a first timer at all. What advice would you give to aspiring actors and actresses? Uh, what I would give the uh, aspiring actors and actresses is keep training, always train, uh, work as much as you can because I, I, I notice that when I'm working a lot, I, you know, if I'm not working, I get rusty. Um, don't try, understand what your brand is. And what I say by brand is, is that you never see Robert De Niro on a horse. I, I burnt up probably ten, year, 10 years of my career trying to be somebody in the 80s that I wasn't just because the leading ladies at the time were like the Sharon Stones, tall, tough, intimidating, you know, X-Men type women. And so I had a picture taken and a scene done where for that nanosecond I can be that person, but that's not my specialty. So, you know, Robert De Niro plays urban types and, and uh, other people play, uh, Robert Redford plays different types. He's, you know, been, and they're both good actors, and they will never play the same types. And, um, you know, Paul Newman is a great director, but he would never play a uh, Sylvester Stallone type. So know your type, have your photograph represent that, have your videotape represent that. Um, uh, don't compromise yourself. Uh, don't do drugs and alcohol. Uh, don't do anything so that you, where you won't like yourself the next day. Um, stay true to yourself. Because when you're, when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to be crying out for that great film you do. You're going to be crying out for the people that meant something. That's you, and so that's that's what you should put your energy into. Um, it, it, we're very you know fortunate. Making it success isn't making it. Success is how you have touched one person in your life and made their life different because you have crossed their path. And um, this other stuff that we get to do is it, it's a bonus if it happens. But you have to do it because you love it, and you can't do it for the money because the statistics are: one percent make it, five percent make over the poverty level, and otherwise you don't. So you really have to like it. Try and have an education so that your fallback job isn't being a waiter at night, because as you get older, you can't be that waiter at night, and it's hard on your children to be working at night. Um, what else can I say? Um, People refer you to their friends, not necessarily what's good for you. And and so that has happened to me a lot where I thought I was taking good advice from someone and it was a detriment to my career because I believe them, but they're really placing me with their friend to make them look good to the, and to do the favor for their friend. Do you have any final words or final advice you'd like to give? Uh, my final advice, <laughs> I hope it's not final, but I just want you to go to my, if you have any questions or anything ever, 
it, it is a community. It does, and we, we can do this now where we couldn't do it before. But there's this thing called Facebook. So go to my, not my personal, but my professional Facebook page, which I'm making a commitment to get on it once a week. <laughs> Between being a mom, mom and working, I have so little time. But I will answer your questions. And if I don't get to you right away, it's not about you, it's about something in my life. But I will answer uh, that those questions for you. Because I love actors. And also, I, under, I, I, I wanted to say this, I've sat in on sessions with casting directors where they read people, and you, you learn that they don't get the first choice all the time. Because this actor may not be available, but somebody comes in and blows everybody away and does do the best reading. But then they don't match up right with somebody they cast in another role. And so, at, at one level, everybody's doing great readings. It's just who's the role. Or they, then somebody they're trying to negotiate with, they were able to close the deal with. So it, it, you, never, you never know. Just go out there and even if you think you're wrong for the part, just do it as you because then they'll, casting directors talk to one another and, or they'll bring you back for something, that casting director for something else that you're right for. It's, it's how Brad Pitt got cast because one of the Baldwin boys pulled out of Thelma and Louise to do backdraft. Suddenly they had a need and this casting director, I think it's Billy DeModa, who knew this kid from the Midwest, said, I think you should try this kid. And it's a career maker. So just keep getting your face in people and they'll remember you. They'll, they'll put your demo reel up on their, on, in their library to show the producer, listen, this person would be right for this. So just go in and do the best reading you can. And and don't try and 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 do. Just be. And they are your friends. They want you to get the job. Just just don't be a human doing. Be a human being when you, when you stay stay in your your body, not in your head. And the moment you start thinking about, oh I should do this, move this way, or you're and not thinking about what the character's thinking of, you're in trouble. The moment, because that means you're thinking as the actor and not the character. That's my fun word. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hope to see you again and at the finale. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for this. And I'll do a link. I'm building a website, so I'm going to put this on. Thank you. So I, I didn't have professional lighting. How did it work? I just, I'm just in my living room. We actually weren't able to see you. Oh, there's no, oh, it's just video, it's just audio? It is. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, because so, I can see you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>